Thanks for listening to the SSPX podcast. And thanks for watching too. Like some of our previous episodes, we are doing this one on video as well as audio only. So if you're watching, thanks. Head on over to our podcast page and find out some more information about all of our past archives. We have many episodes that you can sort through. Just visit sspxpodcast.com or vice versa. If you're listening to this on audio, head on over to our YouTube page. Just search SSPX News and you'll be able to see an audio version of this same exact episode. This week, we're speaking with Father Paul Robinson for an episode of Questions with Father. Normally, we take two, three, or four questions from you know various listeners, and usually they're totally unconnected from each other, uh, and we make a show out of it. Uh, this week, we had one listener write in with some very pointed but very valid questions, uh, and so we decided to make one episode primarily about the coronavirus pandemic. Now, we've already done one show about uh, the coronavirus pandemic. We did that at the very beginning. Uh, and if you are looking at the uh, descriptions on your podcast page or here on YouTube, you'll be able to find a link to that episode there. You can listen to that or you don't have to, but uh, we are talking specifically today about the response to it. What did the Catholic Church uh, do in response to the coronavirus pandemic? And specifically, since this is the SSPX podcast, what did the U.S. District of the Society of St. Pius X do? Should we have obeyed the lawful authority? At what point does lawful authority, when it comes from the state, conflict with the authority that we have from God to worship as we choose? These are some very tricky questions that we've never really had to live through until this year of 2020. So we're going to dive into that. We're going to take a close look at what are the boundaries between obedience to our practice of our faith versus obedience to lawful authority and the authority of the state, which does have the authority per St. Thomas Aquinas and every theologian to oversee the common good. Where do we find that balance? So we'll be diving into that over the next 30 minutes with Father Robinson. With that basic introduction out of the way, let's turn to our interview with Father Paul Robinson. All right. Well, good afternoon, Father Robinson. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Questions with Father. How are things going with you? Uh, going pretty well, Andrew. We've entered the summer now, and um, yeah, things have settled down a bit now that school is over. Good, good. And it's no rest for the weary. Um, I'm sure you're getting ready for next school year here in the school setting uh, as of right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. We still have meetings going on throughout the summer. And uh, we, we did just have our commencement ceremony here on Saturday. We had to delay it because of the coronavirus. We ended up having an outdoor ceremony um, with social distancing. So uh, it was it was nice to, to have that, to be able to have, to be able to have something. Um, and uh, yeah, now that that's over, we're looking towards the next academic year. Very good. Very good. Well, we have a few questions to get to today. Um, but before we do that, could we start with a prayer, Father? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who dis instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same Spirit, that we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Pius X. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, we have a few questions, um, but they're all kind of on the same topic, um, and they're all from the same listener. Um, this listener listened to the episode that we recorded at the very beginning of the whole coronavirus coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and this listener had some follow-up questions. And so we're really just going to be doing a response to that today, Father. Um, the questions questioner started, I listened to the episode, and we'll be linking to this if you haven't listened to that episode. You may want to listen to it, uh, but we'll, we'll link to it here in the podcast notes. The listener said, I was hoping that you could address the balance between nature and supernature or the natural realm and the supernatural in the realm of prudential judgment. So we're talking here about closing churches or not having as many masses, you know, all the things that the SSPX and other chapels had to do throughout this coronavirus pandemic uh, in order to have a response to this. 
The only explanations, the listener said, that I've ever received have been 100% based in the natural, that is, fear of physical harm, deference to temporal authority, with no mention of the respective duties we owe to God and the sovereign rights of the church. We have a duty to worship God, the listener says, therefore we have a right to do those things to offer him worship. So we've been hearing this a lot, Father. The law of God trumps the law of man. So why are we listening to the laws of men? Why are we listening to legitimate authorities when it comes to closing down mass? Yeah, so, I mean, um, obviously uh, it's been very, very painful for people to uh, be away from mass and to see the churches shuttered sure. um, and to have to, to stay home um, for a long time. Thankfully, we've now opened up to a great degree. And, I mean, even, even here in Denver, we really never— actually had to shut down. We, we were able to maintain the churches open um, and have hours of adoration, but I know that's not the case in, in many places. Um, but I mean, the, the, the real question here is whether in principle it's permitted to shut down a church um, on the basis of concerns for the public health. And um, there, there seems to be this false dichotomy between um, the health of the body and the health of the soul uh, that somehow uh, they're, they're thinking that if you're if you're not um, going to church in order to take care of your body, uh, that somehow you're doing something against God, you're violating the rights of God. Um, and mm -hmm. this perspective might might not see the fact that that we um, we do receive our bodies from God. I mean, God God is at the origin of not just the supernatural level, but also the natural level. And and so they they go together. They're, they're, there's both of them, and they have to seamlessly go together. So we do have a duty to God to take care of both our bodies and our souls. Um, right. So there are definitely situations where. Uh, we may not um, be in a situation where we, we would want to go to Mass because um, doing so would endanger our health. And we all know uh, that when we are sick, um, we are excused from going to Mass. So if, if you're right. in bed, you've got a fever, you know, you can't even get out of bed <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because it's so right. bad, um, then of course you say, you know, I just I just can't make it to mass that sure. Sunday. Um, so if there there is there are definitely in principle situations where um, for the service of God, um, because of the fact that He's given you, you the body that you have and you have a duty to take care of it. I mean, for the honor of God, you would want to stay home. And, and not go to mass. Um, so, I mean, like you're sort of crawling through the streets and you, you, you get to mass and then you just like sort of die when you, when you make it there. Um, that, that would not be the, the right thing to do. Um, it would not be, let, let's just put it this way, it, it would not be giving honor to God uh, because of the fact that you you were taking care of your soul um, in a certain sense, but you were neglecting the care of your body and both of right. them come from God. So we have to take care of our bodies because they come from God uh, we have to take care of our souls become because they come from God. So um, a, a, a decision to preserve your body from a disease does not have to come from the wrong motive. It can be the, the right motive uh, to be taking care of your health. The fact that, that you want to um, honor what God has given you, um, take care of the body that he's given, given you to, to take care of. Okay. So what you're saying is that there's this balance between the two between the soul and the body. Um, it's not necessarily that uh, just because we want to preserve our health that we're saying we don't believe in uh, that our soul is more important. Um, it's just that there's a balance between them. Yes. I mean, we're, we're not saying let's not take care of our soul or let's neglect our soul. And we're not saying let's neglect God either. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're saying that in this particular situation, uh, to do service to God means I, I need to, to take care of my body and preserve my bodily health. Because if, if I'm dead, and obviously I can't go to Mass anymore. You know? sure. um, so I, I think the, 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 once we establish that, that um, there, there are situations in which um, you know, a, a person is not only justified but even has a duty to, to stay away from mass in order to take care of, of his bodily health, um, and then he has to take care of both his soul and his body, then, then we have to come to the question of, well, what's the balance between the two? Um, mm. And, you know, it's clear that, that our soul is definitely more important than our body. So there has to be a grave risk to our body um, to justify us 
um, staying away from mass. So if, you know, I mean, if, if someone came to confession, they're like, Father, you know, I stay away from mass. And I'd be like, okay, well, well why, did, why didn't you go to mass? And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I had a cold or <laughs> oh, my, 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 right. my throat was a little bit sore, you know. Um, I would say, well, I, I really don't think that, you know, it's not something contagious. It's, it's not something serious. Um, so really you should, you should probably have gone to, to mass. Um, and if there are situations where extreme situations where it's a question of, of either the body or the soul, okay. then it's clear that I have to, to sacrifice, I have to be willing to sacrifice my body uh, for the sake of my soul. Some, I, I guess some people are some seeing this coronavirus situation is kind of like that, that shouldn't I just sacrifice my body for the sake of my soul? Um, I, I should go to mass and contract the coronavirus and die like a man, you know? <laughs> for sure, right. And in that case, you, you know, the bishops, Father Wegner, I'm sure in every country in the world, in Every diocese, every district of the Society of St. Pius, the 10th in the world, there have been, uh, you know, the superiors have said, you don't have to go to mass if you are at this or in this high risk category or whatever. Uh, they've given that dispensation. So like you said, it's not an either or thing in this case. You don't have to choose damnation or health. It, it's you. Uh, in this case, you can have both. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, if you are in a situation where it's either um, I lose my body or I lose my soul, then clearly you, you, you have to choose right. your soul over your body. But right. if it's a situation where um, I have to take care of my body um, and taking care of it, I will not lose my soul, um, then you are obliged to to take care of your body. So so um, if there is a real risk to my body, I, there's there's some sort of lethal contagion going around in the body politic and in, in society, um, and I, I, I would have a high chance of contracting that, and I might lose uh, my, my health and die, then, um, yeah, I, it's not be wrong for me to stay at home because of the fact I can still perform private devotions. Um, I don't have to make an act of apostasy. You know, sure. um, there's nothing requiring me to abandon my faith in order to take care of my body. Uh, whereas if you are in that situation where you're standing before a, a, a pagan Roman emperor and he's saying to you, look, I'm going to kill you if you do not offer incense to the God, unless you can perform an act of apostasy. And, and kill your soul effectively, or the situation where, um, like of Maria Goretti, where uh, there's this man coming after her and he's demanding a, an act of fornication that she knows would be a mortal sin, you know, and she would um, cause the death of her soul, or or he's going to kill her, um, right. then yeah, then then she is is obliged to to lose her life in order to preserve the good of her soul. Um, but but the coronavirus situation is just not one of those situations. I mean, because of the fact that that a person staying home from mass um, is is not going to necessarily lose their soul. I mean, if it went on for a very long time, like like even a, you know a year or two year, even even six months, I think would would be pretty bad. Um, then you would not have access to the ordinary means of sanctification. It would be difficult to maintain your spiritual health and and so on. Um, but if it's if it's just a month or, or six weeks or something like that, um, then of course your soul can survive, and you don't have to lose the faith. Right, right. Um, and there's plenty of follow-up questions here, um, but I wanted to get to a portion of this discussion where we're going to dive into: uh, is the coronavirus is the coronavirus real? Not real, you know those kinds of things. And I, I pause because that's just kind of a delicate thing. Um, we don't want to be a political show. We're not epidemiologists, um, even though Father, I know you like science. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is some bearing here because there are many people who say um, the coronavirus is not a real danger to us. It's not that important. It's not a big deal. Um, so for those people who do believe that, let's ask the question, Father. For those people who say coronavirus is not a big deal, and so you're saying we need to have a balance, I'm having balance, they're saying. The coronavirus isn't a big deal, so we need to go to Mass. What do you say to that, Father? Yes, well, I, I mean, uh, I think it's important that we understand that initial point, that there are situations in which it is prudent and, and it is um, 
uh, even an obligation before God that, that we would stay home in order to preserve our health. But those situations are when there is a grave risk to the health. And so the question becomes, is the coronavirus such a risk? Um, was there such a risk or is there such a risk at this time? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when it first happened, when it first hit the United States um, in February, there just wasn't a lot of information out there. Right. And based on on the, the rumors we were hearing or, or even the, the number of deaths in, in China or Italy, Italy yeah. um, it seemed like it might be something really terrible. Um, and so the public authorities were... were making these pro projections of, of like millions of dead in the United States. Um, and I mean, if that if that was correct, um, then it, it would have been something very, very serious. And we didn't know at, at the time. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not epidemiologists. We're, we're, we're priests are not um, in a position to advise people on taking care of their health. Meanwhile, the authorities do have um, the right to to um, take care of the public health and, and, and ask that, that people stay home if there truly is a plague that's running around everywhere. Um, but the, the thing is, uh, you know, it would be totally imprudent for a priest who doesn't have expert knowledge to stand up and say, um, based on my studies, um, this is just not real. Um, right. I, I think that sometimes what, what happens is people do their own studies and they come to their own conclusions and they're different from the conclusions of the experts and they think they're right and they want us priests to to follow that. But, you know, I, I as a priest in, in charge of, of, of my faithful here in Denver, I right. can't take the advice of some private person who's done Internet research about the coronavirus and them advising me, look, you need to, to have masks with as many people as possible <laughs> because – I don't because I don't believe the studies that are coming out. Right. Um, I, I, I just can't act on on that information, um, and it would be very imprudent to do so. So I, I think the response of the society was was perfectly balanced, and and I, I mean I think I was. You know, it was one of those times where I'm very proud to be a, a priest of the Society of St. Pius X because I thought the, the response was so balanced in the sense that, um, on the one hand, we didn't tell the public authorities, you know, get lost and we're just going to ignore you and, and disrespect uh, your authority. Um, and on the other hand, we, we made as much use as possible of the permissions that, that they were giving us. So they were setting down certain regulations. Um, and they were they were saying, for instance, that you can have gatherings of, of 10 or uh, you can do this, you can do that. And and we were still hearing confessions and, and doing uh, Holy Communion, distributing Holy Communion, even though we weren't having masses with with, you know, 100 people. Um, we were still distributing the sacraments. Um, and meanwhile, un unfortunately, it was a bit of a, a scandal, I think, worldwide is a, a lot of these Catholic uh, dioceses were going beyond the recommendation of the public health experts. They were um, not even making use of the permissions that were being given. They just completely right. closed up shop and were not taking care of, of their faithful um, where I, I think a lot of people observed that the society was doing everything that we could um, within the guidelines of the law to nourish our faithful throughout the whole of, of the crisis. Um, and I think that was the proper balance. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was it was on our YouTube channel. We have a, a sermon uh, given by Father McFarland here in Phoenix, uh, and he'd recounted getting this letter from a bishop um, in the United States. Uh, he didn't say which diocese it was or... Uh, actually, let's let's play a little bit of it because it's it's really relevant to what we're saying right now. A month or two ago, probably about two months by now, an American Archbishop canceling masses in his diocese on account of the COVID-19 virus said, "My number one priority as your Archbishop is to ensure the safety and health of all who attend our masses, the children in our schools." and those who we welcome through our outreach and services. My number one priority is your safety and health. With all due respect, Your Excellency, no, it's not. Your priority as Archbishop is the salvation of the souls entrusted to you. And so that's kind of what you're saying. I mean, yes, you have to, the bishops do have to look after health and safety, but that's not the number one concern. And that's what you're saying. The bishops went 
even beyond what the state was saying. The state, which is allowed to make these recommendations based on the principle of the common good, um, the bishops went even further than that. And that's what you're saying was the real scandal. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, um, if the, the, the there is basically three responses possible to to the situation, Andrew. Okay. One is is where you tell the government, you know, just get lost. You tell the local authorities, get lost. We're doing whatever we want, and okay. we're just going to put ourselves out there in order to get thrown in jail if we had to get thrown in jail, whatever. <laughs> um, the the other extreme is is uh, to say, well, we're just going to basically uh, hide ourselves in 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 our our holes and and not come out until it all blows over. Um, right. and, and not take care of our faithful. Um, so I, I think the society's response was in the middle, where we we used um, whatever permissions were available to take care of our faithful. Um, and from my perspective here, at least in the situation in, in Denver, um, our faithful were, were definitely able to continue to be nourished throughout the whole thing because sure. they still had access to confession and, and Holy Communion, those ordinary means of sanctification. Um, so it, it wasn't a big danger for their souls. Um, sure. Yeah. And, and we touched on this, that, that the authorities do have the right to set these restrictions. They do have that ability, uh, that God-given authority uh, to be able to do that, um, given that that authority does come from God is what I mean. Uh, but there are some things that the authorities cannot do. And where the priests and the bishops should stand up and in a sense, rebel or rise up, not rebel, uh, but rise up against what is illegitimate. Um, could you touch on that a little bit, Father? Yeah, I mean, this is this is another case where, you know, I think the society, I, I realize I'm sort of patting ourselves on the back. But, <laughs> Go ahead. But uh, I, I thought that we did quite well because of the fact that definitely as traditional Catholics, we know that authority, no authority is unlimited. Um, in principle, right. the authorities have the right to legislate concerning public health, but the way in which they do it. Um, must be just. Mm -hmm. And and there were definitely cases in which it was clear that the authorities were wanting to use the occasion to shut down religion. I think Mm -hmm. for for the majority of states, um, the states declared that that religious worship was an essential service for people. And and that's absolutely true. It is an essential service. And we we definitely hold that. Um, There is um, an essential need for people to worship God. Um, And that's why in, in many cases, no matter what the restrictions were, churches were allowed to stay open and have groups of 10. Um, throughout the whole thing, as as was the case here in Colorado. Right. Um, but there were some situations where <clears throat> they would say, well, you know, liquor stores can be open, grocery stores can be open, but churches cannot be open, um, not even for groups of 10. Um, and that's just obviously unjust and, and wrong. Um, and in those cases, um, the Society of St. Pius or a priest of the Society of St. Pius X took legal counsel and actually sued the, the governments um, that took place in, in um, New Jersey. Um, probably a lot of our listeners um, saw Father Kevin Robinson, not Father Paul Robinson, Father Kevin Robinson <laughs> on T- uh, Tucker Carlson's show speaking about the legal action he took against Governor Phil Murphy in New Jersey. Um, and more recently, uh, Father Seuss and Father Nicholas Stamas in, in New York took legal action uh, through Chris Ferrara of the Thomas More Society um, against uh, Bill de Blasio, the, the mayor of New York City, and under Cuomo, um, the governor of New York, for the fact that they were shutting down churches, not allowing indoor or outdoor religious services, even though they were allowing uh, indoor visits to malls and, and outdoor protests. Um, sure. And and just a few days ago, the news came out that they, they won. A federal judge actually decided that, that they were right and, and ruled for the state of New York, um, churches should be allowed to be open. Yeah, that's great. And and I misspoke earlier, uh, Father, when I framed this question, I, I used the word rebel. And I just want to make sure that our listeners do understand I, I, I totally misspoke there. Um, this is not an act of rebellion for our priests to go through these legal means. This is the proper way to go about it. We're, we're not like, like you said, thumbing our nose and saying, forget you, you or your authority doesn't matter. We're going through the proper channels and saying, no, let's go through the legal system. Let's make sure that this is right. And, and happily, you know, in New York, the federal judge said, you're correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's when you, 
um, go to an, an authority and um, say, well, it seems in this case the, your authority is being abused. It's not um, want, disrespecting the system of authority in itself. I mean, it's hopefully the same balance that we keep with regards to the Pope. We're just saying right. that in certain cases, if if what you're you're legislating is is against the the, the law of God, you know, um, it, it's against justice. Um, in this case, it's against justice for for them to have different regulations for the churches than they have for other other places. Um, but I mean, from the beginning, it's, it didn't seem to me that this was an attack on religion because right. of the fact <clears throat> that they shut down sports. I mean, if they shut down sports, <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> this yeah. must be, they must think it's really, really yeah. serious and they yeah. must be really, really worried about it. Um, so when they shut down March Madness, yeah, that was pretty rough. You um, knew it was real. <laughs> <laughs> but in some cases, they, they even went beyond that. It was clear that they were they were showing a bad preferential treatment for religion. In those cases, that you know, sure. it was it was perfectly uh, legitimate for us to take legal action against them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one more thing I wanted to bring up, and I've heard this from people that I go to church with, and I'm sure you've uh, you've heard it as well. Um, and that is almost a sense of if I go to mass, then God will protect me. Um, you know, Father Wagner asked that all the holy water be removed from the churches, uh, you know, during these times. Um, you know, that was one of the measures that we did. Um, you know, receiving the Holy, the holy Eucharist, uh, going to Holy Communion, you know, there were many howls from the left, uh, whether secular or in the church, saying, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, and a lot of people said, well, no problem. I'm receiving Holy Communion. God will not give me the coronavirus through that. Or God will not give me the coronavirus if I'm going to Mass or something like that. Um, how do you come down on that question, Father? Is Does making a pious act protect you from receiving a natural virus? No, it, de it definitely doesn't. Um, you know, this is one of those cases where you have to bi balance piety with, with doctrine. Um, and... You, we know that, for instance, the Holy Eucharist, um, it, it's a doctrine of the church that the substance is the substance of our Lord, but the accidents are the accidents of bread and wine. And that's why um, the Eucharistic species behave exactly like bread and wine mm. after the consecration. Um, and, and to deny that is is effectively to fall into, into heresy, um, some form of heresy. So, the same is true for holy water. Um, the, 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 in, in, again, with, with Holy Communion, um, you can contract disease from, from holy water. Um, the fact that it has been blessed by a priest does not um, change it from being water to being something else. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't change it into some substance that now is uh, immune from, from possessing any viral substance inside of it. Sure. Um, and the, the same is, is definitely true of Holy Communion. There's, um, that's why the, the, the church uh, with the pontifical masses has always, always had the custom in the medieval times, especially oh, yeah. having the, the, the pre gustatio um, <laughs> for a pontifical mass. This was the, this was the unlucky fellow um, who had to go to the, the sacramental matter and taste the sacramental matter before the consecration, just in case the, the cup was poisoned, the wine was poisoned, um, because there would be instances of bishops, bishops dropping dead <laughs> when they right. consumed the precious blood right. because someone had put someone wanted to knock him off they put poison in there um, and that just goes to show that that at the moment of consecration even though the poison was there um, the poison didn't go away um, after after the consecration I mean if, and if the, the bishop was was super holy you know he would make the sign of the cross we, we know that I think that happened with Saint Benedict yeah. or one of those those early saints um, to where they were able to detect that, that there was some problem and get rid of the poison. Um, but for more normal <laughs> Catholics, it, it doesn't work when they pronounce the words of consecration. And we've talked about this before, Father, that thinking some of these things, you know, while you absolutely, uh, you, you commend someone's piety, um, at the same time, it does sort of border on the superstition where, well, if I put a St. Benedict medal above my house, nothing bad can happen to me. Uh, you can't rely on that only. You know, you can't plan on, it's a bit of imprudence just to think that God will protect you no matter what you do, uh, no matter 
you don't have to take any other precautions. As long as I'm doing something pious, I'm fine. And we know that that's not the case. That's, that's a bit of superstition, I think. Uh, what do you think, Father? Yes, I mean, uh, these, these things are not talismans. Um, they're, they're not, they don't work magic or anything like that. Um, they, they are meant to be devotions where we make acts of faith. Um, and they, they do have a certain power um, from our faith that all sacramentals work that way. Um, they're not like the sacraments, which work of themselves. Um, but the sacramentals are, are more work through our faith. Um, and so the stronger the belief, the, the, it's, it's like, it's like a, a prayer in action. Um, the stronger the belief, the, the more God will respond to that. Um, but it's not just like automatically because I, I put the metal there, it, it, it works ex opere operato and it's going to preserve me from everything. Um, no, I mean, if, if your faith is very strong, then, then God will go out of his way to protect you. But if it's not, then yeah, chances are you, you, you might need a bit more protection than you've got. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Well, Father, thank you so much for going through these questions with us. And uh, it's, it's 2020. <laughs> it's a weird time, I think. I, I think uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we'll all be able just to go, uh, so Father, 2020, huh? And you'll go, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> We're living in strange times and there's a lot of confusion. Um, and you're needing to answer questions I'm sure you've never had to answer before. Yeah. Yeah, there's this there's this meme going out there, the, this scene from from the the movie Back to the Future, where there's Michael J. Fox and the professor is advising them, and he says, "Don't put 2020 in there you know, for, the, for for his uh, uh, car that goes into the future." You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do not do that date, no matter what. Uh, it's funny. <laughs> well, Father, thank you so much for taking the time with us, um, like usual, and uh, we'll chat again soon. My pleasure, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the SSPX podcast. We appreciate you taking the time to listen or to watch. As always, there are ways that you can help. The first way is free, and that is just by subscribing to the SSPX podcast on whichever podcast app or program you like to use. Just hit that subscribe or like or follow button. Just depends on which one you're using. Uh, and also leaving us a rating, leaving us a five-star rating uh, really helps us to be more visible when more people search for Catholic podcast, things like that. So if you could leave a rating and a review uh, and subscribe to it, that would help to spread uh, the message of basically traditional Catholicism. If you are able to also, a more concrete way of helping is to leave a five or 10 or $20 donation. Uh, all the information for that is on sspxpodcast.com, particularly if you're able to do just a $5 or $10 donation per month. If we know we have those recurring donations come in, uh, that helps us know that we have uh, the monetary needs to uh, continue this project, to continue this apostolate. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, and until next time, God bless you.